Welcome, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, now the virtual CSFI. Uh, we've been running a series of videos and, on movers and shakers in the city of London. We, in this case, being my colleague, my co-director, Jane Fuller, and today's guest is Michael Manelli. Many of you will know Michael. He has at least three and a half different hats. One of his hats is that he is the Aldermanic Sheriff, of the City of London for 2019-2020. Uh, that gives him a, an important role in the symbolic side of the city, but it's also uh, a role which moves quite a lot of money around. He's also the executive chairman of ZEN, which is a consultancy that he founded, which has done many, many good things. It uh, runs the Global Financial Centers Index. It runs the Green Finance Index. It runs the Smart uh, Cities Index. He is also the progenitor of something called the Long Finance Initiative, which is a, an interesting way of trying to get financial services to look a little bit further into the future than it has done in, in the past. And that's obviously particularly important now. And last but not least, he's the Emeritus Professor of Commerce at Gresham College. Uh, so those many hats, uh, the topic is London after COVID-19. Uh, where do we stand? First of all, let me ask my colleague, Jane Fuller, to add anything that she wants to those questions that we should put to, uh, to Michael. Jane. Well, one of the things that struck me is that having read your uh, surveys of London as a financial centre over, over many years, is that some of the, the negatives, such as house prices, transport, just the sheer expense of the place, crowding have been solved, sadly, uh, or partially solved by COVID-19. But everything else, which has been an advantage from whether it's professional services um, to um, the museum's culture, um, are laid low by COVID-19. So it, it feels like a sort of topsy-turvy financial centre at the moment. Okay, so let us let me ask you, Michael, I mean, First of all, let's have your first hat as the Aldermanic Sheriff, uh, the ornamental part of the city, the uh, ceremonial part of the city, but again, one of the major, one of the major proponents of the city internationally. How is that going? Well, the uh, aldermanic sheriff role is one of supporting the Lord Mayor and the, the team at the City of London Corporation. And just for those listeners who aren't familiar with it, uh, that's the traditional square mile. It's actually the old Roman walls. Uh, and it still has relevance today. We have relevance as having local authority powers. We are not a local authority, but the powers act as local authority, which allows us to develop the square mile. But in addition, in a way that the Chinese uh, like to call it, but it is kind of helpful, we're effectively a vertical. We represent not just financial services, uh, but also a lot of professional, business, technical, and financial services. So accountants, lawyers, uh, banks, and insurers globally as part of the Lord Mayor's outreach campaign. So that's the th th that's the area there. Um, frankly, uh, the social side of it, along with everything else, came crashing to a halt six weeks ago. Uh, not surprising. And that is a fair chunk of the role in terms of getting out there and meeting people and delivering it. However, uh, we immediately, as many, including CSFI, uh, switched instantly into the backup systems we already had. Uh, we're very avid Teams users, and we've been holding regular and constant meetings. The things that we did uh, started really uh, with the local authority element. So the relief of rates for businesses, uh, care for people and direct beneficiaries. We've also been having a lot of chats with some amazing initiatives that the livery companies have been doing. A group of them, I, I probably won't do them all justice, but it certainly it includes the uh, drapers, uh, the skinners, the merchant tailors, uh, have turned their kitchens into delivering food to NHS staff uh, around the city for free. Uh, so there's been a lot of good stuff going on and a lot more will be happening. But ultimately, it's a restricted role. Uh, it's a nationally led campaign and program. And a lot of our reactions are those of a typical local authority. At the next level up, which is the global and international projection, uh, the Lord Mayor instantly as well switched to the meetings that he would have normally had 
with incoming dignitaries in various cities around the world. Uh, and that is being conducted constantly. In fact, in some ways, I feel sorry for uh, William Russell, the uh, alderman who is Lord Mayor this year, in that he is uh, constantly sitting there, I think, with headphones on, uh, knocking off uh, 15 and 30 minute calls all day uh, and doing a good job at keeping up the promotion and connections. Uh, it is difficult to see uh, when we move on the redevelopment, redeployment of the Lord Mayor's outreach program. The Lord Mayor typically sees 25 uh, to 30 countries in every year, spends over 100 days abroad traveling on diplomatic engagements and missions. And of course, that has come to a halt. We can't correctly foresee when it would move forward. We also had a couple of events, most notably, I believe it's next week, we were due to uh, greet, along with the rest of the nation, uh, the Emperor of Japan, and that obviously was was, was canceled. Uh, and so a lot of this type of uh, engagement work uh, we need to think about. And I don't think that going forward, it will be done in quite the same way. There have been some advantages uh, to, to moving online, and there will certainly be further restrictions for some time on the traditional physical events, at least happening in exactly the form that they happened in the past. At least I hope that he's going to be wearing the funny gear when he does his videos. I mean, I'm astonished that you aren't. Um, look, tell us a little bit about, um, you You recently published the Global Financial Centers Index, you as yeah. the Yen. Uh, tell us about where London stands as far as the GCFI was concerned last month and where you anticipate that it will stand post-COVID. Yeah, it's, um, well, look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, an unashamed promoter of uh, the City of London and financial services and professional services and all of that, uh, but it's it's grim out there, uh, and it's grim for a few reasons, and that's uh, pre-COVID. Uh, so let me just give a little bit of a historical perspective. The Global Financial Centers Index uh, was begun in uh, 2005, so 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Uh, it was first published in 2007, March of that year. So we've got a-, a pretty... that That's the first one you did. We did one before and you took it over. Ah, uh, yes. Sizing up the city, I recall, in 2002. Uh, and But Sizing Up the City looked at four centers, and the initial GFCI looked at 55. And so it was a, a real change in the, the scale of trying to create a, 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 an index uh, that people could use to measure longitudinal growth. And during the bulk of that period, uh, London has been number one with New York number two. Now, remember, we're looking at international centers, uh, and New York and London are frankly, roughly comparable. But when you look at the international component of, of New York, it is rather small. And the quick and sharp example I like to give is I've done a lot of uh, corporate finance deals over the years. I used to be in the M&A division of one of the larger corporate banks. And uh, one of the intriguing things is that we would never go to New York to do, say, a three-way deal that didn't have an American component. But you will find in London, Singapore, and up until recently Hong Kong, people who may be a Brazilian, a French, and an Indonesian company agreeing that they would do the deal in, in this third jurisdiction. So it's that international uh, bit that matters. Well, moving forward then, uh, there was a short period of time, I think from memory around 2010, 11, when New York pipped London, but it was a pip by a point or something. Uh, London gained it back, but, but sadly in the last two GFCIs, September last year, September 2019, and March uh, last month, uh, London has slipped to, to number two position. But it didn't just slip, it dropped. On what criteria did it slip? Um, uh, was that London slipping on New York actually making itself more competitive? Uh, it's very, very much London slipping, uh, without question. And most of that was Brexit. Mm. Um, so, so, you know, it's difficult in this period of COVID to sort of say, Brexit, what was that? But uh, mm. it, it clearly dominated uh, uh, thinking. And, and, the, and the facts are uh, that major businesses, uh, Barclays, uh, City, HSBC, really moved operations. The minute they move headquarters, headquarters are black holes. They accumulate staff and they swirl them in. And so each of the last three years, you see these temporary transient brass plate headquarters that were going to be kept to 50 or 100 people, now up at the 300, 400 mark. It's the way real life works. Uh, and we've been uh, muttering about that, that this was not anything to be sanguine about. Uh, and the Brexiteers were saying, yeah, 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 but it doesn't matter all the great opportunities. Well, we haven't seen those. And then in addition, we're not seeing the growth in small businesses that we've seen traditionally within the financial services sector. 
I must say, in fact, the city of London uh, figures for growth in SMEs is doing not badly at all, actually. Uh, some degree, I, I consider the city of London an SME generating factory. Remember, financial services some 36 years ago wasn't particularly that large, certainly not the international side. Uh, Goldman Sachs comes to London in the late 80s with an office for 30 people. So this is all fairly recent. We're seeing media, culture, sports, drama, all this moving up. Uh, so London as, a, as a, an economic center is not doing poorly at all. In fact, we're thriving. Our latest figures are we've, we're well over 525,000 well, workers. Hang on, let me pick you up on that. You yep. said that in the financial services sector, smaller companies in London were not doing that well. Uh, overall, smaller companies in the city of London are doing well, but financial services not so much. Correct. But of course, we consider ourselves to be number two, at least, in, in fintech. You don't see it quite that same way. Well, I, I, I personally, there's a, there's a big distinction between the government propaganda numbers and the real numbers. So any reasonable uh, estimation of fintech, frankly, points you very strongly at China, without question. Uh, and that's it. Within Europe, the, the, the numbers are a bit funny as well. There's probably as much fintech investment in Berlin, which is a city of the quarter of London size, as there is in London. London is a gateway for a lot of U.S. fintech investors who want to get access. Then you've got to also remember that the bulk of English uh, fintech is actually kind of unhobbling yourself. You know, you've got all these fancy applications on phones. And what does it do? Well, it gets you through the anti-money laundering really fast. Why is the anti-money laundering the problem? <laughs> uh, is is not the question that's being asked. And so when you go to China, I mean, some of the most embarrassing things I see are uh, had a chairman of a Chinese bank over last year at a function, and all these British fintechs were explaining that if he was to use their stuff, he he could get more customers. Uh, so they're startups, and he's sitting there with eight hundred million customers. <laughs> and, and I don't I, I don't think he was happy. Or you know, I had three days with Alipay last year. And it's the same thing, you know, they are on a completely different scale. Uh, and we sort of sit here quite insular about what we consider fintech. Do you think we've lost that battle? Alipay, Tencent, Alibaba, um, Baidu. Have we really lost that or is there still a, either a niche or can we compete on the, the main battlefield? I think, I think our analysis is terrible. Um, <laughs> London has been a fintech center since 1980, roughly 83. You know, once Big Bang was announced, that's why I came to the city in 84. I was a scientist deep into computers, and I could tell that there was going to be a huge demand for computers. We've been putting computers into finance for ages, but it's been at the wholesale level. And that is London's fintech strength, is wholesale. It's not developing some kind of retail front-end lipstick on a pig application to slap a, you know, a mobile phone in front of a, an antiquated RBS you know, creaking system. That can't stand up. It's it's actually about all the deep plumbing and piping. Um, unfortunately, that's extremely hard to explain to a minister who wants a photo shot and a ribbon cutting ceremony for some new office. But that is our strength, and I I, I think we can play much more to that. There's a long way to go on that front, and I, I don't think people understand some of the deep techniques of combining, say, uh, GPS systems and accurate timings. Uh, with you know, uh, you know, uh, like a, an extremely detailed micropayment system. So there's a lot of stuff that we're doing, but it just doesn't it doesn't grab those type of headlines, and it doesn't grab the analysis that people is, like to put boxes on. We're talking now at the very end of uh, London FinTech Week uh, mm. or London FinTech Fortnight, as it happens. Yeah. Um, what either can the government or, for that matter, the Corporation of the City of London do to encourage the kind of fintech initiatives that you would like to see? Well, uh, the, I, I'm not asking for government support. And in fact, if anything, I think government support is uh, is a danger every time the UK... Seems in China. Pardon? Seems to have worked in China. But where, where the Chinese uh, have, have grown quite well is in the... the they've got a, <laughs> You've got a, a homogenous country with a with a simplified identity system, um, and that allows you to layer financial services onto two broad consumer platforms: Alipay and Tencent. So, uh, those those are nicely plugged in. Once you've got that, and you've got the country covered. All the stuff we consider fintech, which is trying to manage your account and bring it on, and open banking, which has taken us years. All those things are stuff the Chinese don't need to go through. Uh, we're not doing much in that regard. And open banking, uh, I know I know it's a poster child for a lot of people, 
but it's been slow and painful. It hasn't done what it was actually originally set out to do. And everybody's busy trying to promote why it's such a success. And I'm not saying that the hearts aren't in the right place and all that, but it's nowhere near the kind of seamlessness of me being able to take my accounts and hand them to people for analysis and bring it back and all of that. It's a clunky clutch on a system that's got a lot, a lot, a lot of embedded bureaucratic processes in it. So um, I, I, I think that the Chinese have got it easier. That, 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 that's that question. So what do I want the government to do? Well, the first thing I'd like the government to do is to get the rhetoric right. Um, again, if you look at a lot of this retail fintech, uh, I think open banking's got, what, nine members? Four or five BMS and four little tiddlers to make everybody feel that it's an open system. But you've only got approximately 50 account-taking institutions in Britain that will actually open up and take money from, from, from anybody on the street rather than a family member or something like that. So they're not, there's not that much to play with. That should all be pushed to one side. That's not particularly exportable anyway. What we really need to be pushing are, are, are the hardcore services. So a rhetoric change would be a help. It would help position things better and get us off of uh, kids playing with a new color app on the front of a, of a game or something and onto the stuff that we're strong in. The second thing is, I'm afraid, broken record time. Uh, it's access, uh, visa access for people. It's actually a country that's not sliding down to 35th in the broadband stakes. Uh, it's uh, making sure uh, that the regulatory regime is one that focuses on uh, consumer protection and things, but doesn't focus too much on the technology. Uh, so it, it, there's absolutely nothing that hasn't been on the plate. And this is what the corporation has been doing, has been gently and carefully lobbying to make sure that these things aren't forgotten. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the government has had a lot of distractions for a, a considerable period of time now. We're getting on to a government that's had legitimate and arguably questionable, but nevertheless, distractions for half a decade. Is that all that the corporation can do lobby? Or, I mean, you're also a landlord. You're, you're an owner of an awful lot of property in the city of London, and you must be a landlord to an awful lot of fintechs. Is there anything you can do to, to give them, a, as it were, a helping hand? Well, we, we've done quite a bit, uh, actually. Uh, so uh, the, the list, uh, in fact, I can't read the list out unless you let me, let me pull it up. It is a really long list. Uh, Angels in the City. Uh, Level 39 was a 50-50 joint venture with Canary Wharf to, again, to promote fintech uh, at, at some interesting levels. We've had uh, umpteen things. Uh, you referred earlier uh, to Fintech Week. Well, that's us and Innovate Finance. So, no, we, we have done a tremendous amount of pro promotion. Uh, and this uh, Innovate Finance uh, Summit Week uh, has grown in five years to encompass it. We're at physical. I think last year the numbers were... 2,200 people, something of that ilk. So we, we've done the, the promotional bit. Uh, we've done the uh, uh, tying people together bit, whether that's through things like uh, the Whitechapel Think Tank, uh, FinTech working groups that we formed. So, and we're trying to consolidate some of that. We, we didn't mind experimentation, but I think there's a little consolidation underway. It's a little difficult to see. Is it Tech Cities UK? Is it who, who's leading in this space? And that's coming together quite naturally. I'm, I'm pretty relaxed about that. But the, it's the basics. What, what, made, what made FinTech happen and made the government wake up to it was when they saw how many jobs had been created and what had gone on. But they hadn't done much for it. I mean, Silicon Roundabout, which they laid claim to at Old Street, was, was, was already there by the time they claimed that it was them what had done it. So you know, it, the best thing is actually the, the groundswell of, of infrastructure opportunities that are, that, are, that are needed, not the government coming in and trying to mollycoddle a sector that doesn't need mollycoddling. Okay, do you have anything to add on the fintech side? Um, and not on the fintech side. So I was just wondering if we could move on to some of the other, I mean, pe people uh, want to have their businesses in London, want to live in London for reasons of, uh, you know, culture, um, the professional services, all sorts of other things. Um, th those things are shut down. Mm. Um, and the things that they haven't liked in the past have been things like high house prices, you know, crowded or expensive transport, just high prices. So, which COVID may be mitigating um, just from the shock, economic shock. So where do you, where do you think this has left London in terms of as, as a sort of whole package for people coming to... Can I just add, add one thing to that? I mean, it, is the COVID 
situation going to mean the end of the clustering, the end of the, the preference that people have for living in cities? Is it going to diversify and disperse the financial services well, sector? Yeah, we, should, we should talk about working from home as well um, later, but just... just on the Michael, on the yeah. Well, I, I can only speculate. I, I don't know for sure, but uh, I, I would say I've got I've got out of one of my. I live in Wapping, so out of one balcony I see all of Canary Wharf, and out of the other balcony mm. I see all of the city. And I can't imagine there aren't many people thinking to themselves, "Gee whiz, seven weeks, <laughs> I haven't been there, and my staff haven't been there." And then when I move back, I start paying a lot of money, so my staff can have coffees together surely there's another way to do this so uh, I, I will expect to see some change uh is it death I, I doubt it people are quite resilient and tend to go back to to norms i, I love that an article in the economist uh this week pointing out that the chinese despite all the covid stuff and all that they still like sharing chopsticks when you just thought I, I don't want to share share chopsticks any longer so so people are, are quite resilient i i don't see that happening overnight However, uh, on COVID, uh, Jane, I think you raised in my mind the, the idea really that all the things that made London great are, 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 are at least called into question. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think that is true. I think we could see a huge change in uh, the value of retail and uh, sorry, of commercial and domestic property. Yeah. You know, sitting here at home, you know, you probably think to yourself, gee whiz, I could use another 500 square feet uh, for a decent office that I could uh, film from or whatever. I think we, we could see a lot of pressure on that. And I think a lot of employers, and this is probably the unseen bit about clustering, that now that I'm comfortable with people working from home, do I care where their home is? Uh, and uh, that, that tension is there where I've noticed it myself. We're doing a lot more calls abroad than we would do in a normal period. Uh, and I, I would therefore, and I'm much more comfortable with perhaps commissioning somebody from abroad based on a phone call than I was if I had met them physically at some point in the past. So I'm expecting some of that social social change to occur. What about, um, the, you, you mentioned the impact of Brexit and you mentioned that damage was done to the city simply as a result of Brexit. Do you see uh, that continuing or do you see that as a temporary phenomenon? Uh, oh, wow. I, I, even without Brexit, the big rise over the last uh, 15 years, 20 years has been the Far East, in particular China. So we were always going to be outshone by that unless we really leapt on it. Uh, a lot of recent uh, discussions about the state of China, and I, I'm not claiming I'm pro-China or anti-China, uh, but it is pretty clear that the country is not wholly comfortable with a strong relationship with China, which is uh, assuming that everything the Chinese do is correct, and that's probably sensible anyway. The problem, though, becomes if, if we're not really on top of China, uh, then we're not on top of the biggest growth aspect or further, further Asian growth aspects. If we're not in Europe, well, that's, that's, that's kind of interesting. So who wants an international financial center unwedded to any major block? Uh, now, there are areas that I can imagine, but there are areas that we've traditionally um, looked down upon. Uh, so your, your classic offshore center, do you want London to be a major offshore center? Is it uh, rather than Singapore on Thames? Is this uh, Jersey on Thames or Guernsey on Thames? Is that what we're trying to achieve? So I we've got Singapore to find a sense of better than Guernsey. Yes, fair enough. We want to find, we want to, we, we need to find a role in the world that, that's, that's coming ahead. Um, and the best way to find that role is probably not to design it, but to make sure that the uh, that the initial conditions that I alluded to earlier, you know, connectivity, air connectivity, uh, uh, blah 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 blah, uh, and the ability for people to come here and do things, because it's actually all about the people. They've gotten over the property uh, issues for for decades. It's always been an expensive city, and somehow people squeeze up, do up, or earn more money to get a bigger place, or afford more commercial property. So they've always been able to do that. As long as we can keep the people element uh, moving, I think we, we've got a lot of potential. Can I just add one thing? I mean, uh, London's international position was really initially 
a, a function of mistakes that the Americans made. Correct. The Americans forced business offshore. Isn't there a chance that the backlash against China and the fact that the Americans will turn increasingly away from globalization and towards some sort of economic nationalism mm. may again give London a role as an international financial center? Uh, you know, I wrote a piece 15 years ago called uh, One, Two, Three, Infinity. And the, the question was, where would you cite a real financial center globally? Where was it going to be completely independent of any block? And if you did that, was it going to be one ruling them all? Was it going to be two? Was it three? Or were all these financial centers going to form a network? Uh, and I personally at that time, and I, I still believe strongly, people want a little bit of choice. Uh, it could be Singapore v. London for example, on a, on a good kind of international aspect for it. So I, I, I definitely see that. Uh, and I think it's an interesting bit of history. You know, uh, I came to the city, as I said earlier, in 84. And uh, despite my bad accent in what I, I started off as my language of my father, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, when I came to the city, there were Italians everywhere. You know, they, they were hanging around under bridges, uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, which, which will date me uh, uh, back on Brosiano. But the, the thing that was interesting, of course, is how that came. So if you were to look at any film of the 50s, 60s, and 70s and try and talk to people about where was the financial center of Europe, it was almost certainly where? Paris. <laughs> you know, it was always Paris. Every American film, they went to Paris. And that's where the if the, the guy had some work to do or he met a PA, she worked for the Parisian branch of a city or whatever. It's uh, actually more boring than that, Michael. Yeah. Manufacturers Hanover, which was the first one to yeah. open in Europe, first of all, looked at Brussels. Not even Paris, it looked at Brussels. True. Because that was where NATO was. Correct. Uh, and so, uh, and, 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 and the thing that created, in many ways, the, the legend of London, which allowed us to blend the years from 39 to, to 79 and on to about, I would date it as around 84 to 86, I put great store on City moving into Deptford, their FX processing operations in 86. To me, that was at least as important a signal as Big Bang, because Big Bang was just local brokers and things. But this was a, a real move. And the thing that kept it going w w was effectively the uh, the Eurobond market. But the Eurobond market was uh, you know, Autostrada, Ferrovia, and you know some of these people better than I do, Andrew. But you know, they, it was a bunch of uh, Italians trying to sell their American brethren on investing in Italy, but the American brethren didn't trust going straight to Italy, uh, wanted English contract law, which the French law didn't do, and they began the deals here. And that left a legend that London was always an international financial center. But the truth is, it, it wasn't that big, and as you pointed out earlier, depended on a, a major mistake in America uh, on the way that it was handling international uh, conglomerate taxation. Um, so yes, China could China could do something, and frankly, the, the odds are it it possibly would, because China is in many ways the Middle Kingdom. It's always been that. Uh, you, know, you, the you, raised something, you raised something just then that's only come up in the last couple of days, and that is the threat to the UK or England's legal system in terms of uh, uh, its potential enforceability throughout the European Union. Mm. Um, that strikes me as enormously serious, unless Very. somebody can, as it were, head it off at the pass. Your thoughts on that, Michael? Well, uh, you're playing into my, my hands here in a, in a nice way. Uh, my brother, Sheriff, and I, uh, Chris Hayward, is my brother, Sheriff. The two of us have chosen uh, as our theme uh, for the year, and in fact, we've had our year extended till next uh, September. So we'll be the first sheriffs in approximately 1,400 years uh, to serve two years. Uh, our whole theme has been the primacy of the rule of law. And every time you drive hard and down and you, you look at what makes a financial center great, it's almost always uh, the basis of law and the idea that you're treating all comers equally. And so it's with little surprise, for example, one might note uh, that Dubai and places like uh, Astana and Singapore are also competing with us on commercial courts uh, and on arbitration and mediation and expert determination. And since Brexit, of course, Dublin has been resurging in this regard as being the only sort of credible English-speaking and common law jurisdiction left in Europe. So uh, we've always been competing on this. Uh, we then turn up uh, with the EU issue. EU issue. And lastly, uh, it's incumbent upon ourselves to be uh, 
extremely respectful of the law. And so some of the uh, assertions and allegations about the, the Supreme Court or about the judges and their rulings on Brexit or whatever, these need to be done with, well, judicial care, may I say. Uh, I think it's important that, that these things are done carefully and not brought into the political maelstrom because so much of the business of the city depends on it. There tends to be a, a, a people focus on all sorts of things, depending on where you've worked in the city. You can focus on insurance or reinsurance. You can focus on banking. You can focus on FX. But there's a huge amount of business that feeds off the back of international uh, arbitration, for example. People are doing scientific inspections on... Uh, on uh, uh, you know petroleum leakages, uh, people are doing satellite imaging, and all of this is supporting court cases. These are accountants are doing forensic accounting reports on what might have been or brand valuations. All that stuff comes to the city, but it comes because everybody believes if they come here and they have some type of uh, legal or quasi legal uh, encounter, it will come out fairly, and that is really crucial. You just read. Sorry, you've just raised one thing, insurance. Uh, the insurance sector could be hit very, very hard yeah. by the, uh, the, the pandemic. I mean, do you have a feel for how well protected it is against the vicissitudes of uh, virus, virus claims? No, I, 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 you know, obviously, I know uh, quite a few insurers at a very, very senior level, and uh, many of them are, are quite worried. Uh, there's also some of the some of the things that are coming over from America are, are rather frightening. So d depending on how you look at the wordings on, for example, business interruption, you could fall in a variety of ways. And I'm not a wordings expert, but I can see that I've looked at a few of these cases myself personally. You can see that depending on the interpretation of the wording, it all falls on the insurer or it's not. But in the U.S., of course, they're saying it doesn't matter what the wording says. Really, it should all fall on the insurer. Um, so these types of behavior are exactly why London has done much better than New York. You, you know, you, you never know in America when somebody's going to come from left field. You never know at so many layers of which laws might affect you. So it's simpler to come here and know that common sense largely rules. Uh, and again, we need to ensure that common sense largely rules. And it may be that the insurers are wrong and they ought to bear the cost of those wordings and perhaps some of them go down. But if it is the case that the wordings are correct and it's not well, correct to the insurer, and it's not, uh, it's not to be paid, then it should be forced to be paid. And this is, I think, a, a crucial bit. Jane? Um, I just wonder about regulation, which is, um, should London's strategy be to be a, a sort of gold, a place with gold standard regulation, which actually arguably Singapore is on the financial side? Um, or should it diverge and make life, go down the road, route again of laissez-faire and uh, making it easy to do business, but you know, maybe not so pristine in a regulatory sense? Well, uh, I've always had several problems with this, this dichotomy. Mm -hmm. The first is we don't gold plate. <laughs> uh, we say we gold plate. We make it expensive if, if you're saying, it's expensive regulation. Yes, it is expensive regulation. It is a gold plate. It is it better. Well, answer me this then. Just take something as basic as anti-money laundering. Uh, if our anti-money laundering is the best and gold plated in the world, why are we widely seen as one of the biggest money laundering centers? Okay. If on the other hand, that's wrong and we're not a money laundering center at all, uh, then why is it so onerous and expensive? And the question I've been repeatedly asking is kind of, you know, if Britain is open for business, try opening a bank account. And that's been a theme. We had an event at the Old Bailey. Uh, we do a lot in the city to promote this, where we actually had people discuss for the first time I had at the head of actually a head of compliance for a major, major global uh, insurance brokerage. And she said it was the best event she'd ever been to because people were talking honestly uh, about the fact that actually it's not gold plated. It's the interpretation of it. And we had we had people. We had a webinar the other week where we had Monzo go through step by step how they go about being so good, <laughs> and it's simply because they have read the rules, uh, and uh, and and they apply the rules and they're regulated like everybody else. And I have been through the absurdity of of having a NatWest account which was absorbed into RBS, where I've had to go down to give some woman who wouldn't know a faked passport from anything else. She then looks at the passport. She then photocopies the passport. Then she ships it up. I mean, 
you couldn't make this stuff up. Mm. Uh, and so I, I think there's a lot that we can do. So it's not about gold plating or, or laissez faire wild west, you know, uh, it, it's actually about being efficient yeah. <laughs> and we are not doing that. And a lot of that falls on to ourselves. It falls onto the fact that we're highly cartelized in the retail sector, but it's beginning to hurt business. And I, the example I give is start with something simple. Well, we were on insurance. Uh, Andrew, you, you are a Malaysian, uh, magnet. Uh, Jane is your factotum. Uh, you've read about this Lloyd's market. And you want some of it to insure your ships. <laughs> okay. So you send Jane to London. Jane gets to London. She goes around the Lloyd's market. They smell money uh, and they make her an offer. We can do your entire fleet, ma'am, uh, for this. So Jane then calls you back. Uh, one little thing, uh, uh, Andrew, uh, we need to know where you live, your passport and everything, all the ultimate beneficiaries. Oh, and all of your all of your folks. Why is that? Well, because the broker won't take us on until we do that. So the broker then takes you on. Then you go around, you get four or five underwriters. And does the broker hand that stuff over? No. Jane says, hey, boss, uh, a month's passed. Need to do that again, if you don't mind. Ah, but uh, Sue Kim moved his house. Ah, that's going to be a bit of a problem. Has he been there for more than three months? Uh, no. So we, we then go through that loop with the four underwriters. Well, anyway, you're, you're persistent. Uh, you, you've decided that going through five sets of paperwork is heaps of fun. So you commission Jane to get a lawyer involved. And the weird thing about these English lawyers is they like getting paid. But unfortunately, they go through the whole AML loop again, you see. And then you've got to open a bank account to pay the lawyer. And it just goes on and on and on like this. And so it is really driving business away. Uh, and people say, oh, but Michael, they could open an account with somebody else. But you've gone to a foreign country. 85% of the advertising is for four banks. <laughs> and, you know, is it your job to poke into Starling or Monzo or Metro because your boss, Jane says, listen, boss, I've been here three months. I really want to go home. <laughs> it's a lot of paperwork and I don't think we're ever going to sign a deal. Yeah. Well, I take your point on that. I mean, but is the, just on the, the other two areas where ZN has uh, done surveys, um, does London have um, uh, a leading edge in green finance or indeed in what the smart cities yeah the, our smart centers index is is one that we are uh promoting that largely winds up in our fintech figures but i think the the global green finance index is intriguing london has a darn good position actually there but oddly it's in what's called depth versus quality so in depth simply by virtue of being one of the top two centers in the world we're really darn good and we're much better than New York in this sector because New York doesn't treat it seriously. Uh, and nationally, green is not treated seriously. Uh, there's a contrary problem, which is that uh, looking within the Global Green Finance Index, it does seem to be a bit of a West European affectation. You know, you, you could begin to look at uh, green as a bit dilettante. Uh, and the other, the other problem we have there is that it's dominated by the idea of green bonds. And green bonds are interesting, but they're, they're, they're just a light layer on. So we're missing things, for example, like uh, renewable energy projects. Uh, we're missing in, in sectors like uh, the ESG policy performance bonds. A lot of these things are going on elsewhere in Europe. But we have the depth to do it. What the quality thing, though, says is that people don't believe we walk the talk. And I know this comes as a bit of a shock to Britons who... Uh, again, believe that they're one of the leading countries against climate change, that you know we've got a net zero carbon target. We've got a lot of things. But the truth is that most of our targets have been broken over the years and slipped. And we've basically taken credit for things like the rush to gas, which was built on a poor pooling structure, which has, of course, led to lower resilience and more brownouts and might lead to more in future as signs of success because they meet our carbon budgets in particular. And then we've got our failed nuclear projects, et cetera. So look at from abroad, we don't look that rosy in that sector in terms of the quality of what we do and the depth and the talk of it, but it, sorry, the quality of our thinking on it. But what we do score on is the depth of our financial skills. Okay, let me, uh, we're coming to the end. Let me ask you one question. Put yourself two, three years into the future. Let's hope that the uh, COVID-19 virus has now disappeared as an issue. Where do you see London as an international financial center? 
Well, for me, if we can keep that open, openness to talent, uh, if we're able to... Uh, oh, King, we haven't discussed that. Of course, will we be open to talent if the universities are not in a position to accept so many foreign students? Correct. And if our visa regime and there are many other obstacles to that, but that is what's made us. It's been, you know, there's no natural resources here to speak of. It's basically people getting together, agreeing to do something in an environment that's conducive to it. Uh, that's that's our strength, and we, we if we can keep that, finance will change, and we will change with it, and probably better for it. If we are able to grow businesses, that's the key thing. Get them here, small, and grow them. That's actually how we built uh, the current financial center. They all started off as small businesses, you know, Messels, Scrimger. These were not big firms, uh, and then they were absorbed, and they grew with the change in, in financial services. And financial services, to me, is going to be much more about high-end IT, uh, commoditization, automatic things. I, I'll probably be sitting there. I don't want to see a bank or an insurer. I'll be looking on my mobile phone and saying, I was in the bar last night. And some guy said to me that the best thing to do was actually Korean healthcare. There's a Korean healthcare ETF. I'll put 2% of my cash into that one, and I walk away from it. Uh, that's That's probably where probably where we're headed. And I personally think that's where the Chinese are headed. They don't see our type of silo structures of asset managers, investment managers, uh, rating agencies, all the stuff that comes with that is very, very expensive. And even we are voting uh, with our feet. If you look at the, the demise of IPOs and listed companies going down, you begin to see that all this regulation, all this so-called consumer protection, all the costs may have been jobs for the boys and girls the last 20 years or so, but ultimately it's not sustainable. We're just making it too expensive. Michael, it's great to talk to you. Michael Manelli, yeah, the you. Ottomanic Sheriff for not just one, but one and a half years. So uh, we're delighted to have you. Thanks to all of you for watching. Thank, Thank you. you, Andrew. Ciao.